Okay, welcome everybody to the Good Hormone Health Webinar, Approaches for Pituitary Surgery. And I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Gata Mehta, who will be telling us a little bit about himself. He's a new neurosurgeon in Los Angeles. Uh, please mute your phones. Um, someone, it sounds like they joined and didn't mute their phone. Please, again, everybody mute your phones. Uh, that's better. Um, we'll be uh, time for chats at the end of the uh, uh, session today, so please leave your questions till then. The topics today include how does Dr. Friedman diagnose Cushing's disease? How does Dr. Friedman determine who goes to surgery? What type of patients need surgery besides those with Cushing's disease? How do the neurosurgeon and the endocrinologist work together? How does the neurosurgeon read pituitary MRIs? What type of surgical approaches are used for pituitary surgery? How long does surgery take and how long will the patient be in the hospital? And what are the risks of pituitary surgery and how could they be minimized? Okay, Dr. Mehta, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, again, thanks for uh, Dr. Friedman for the invitation. Um, I am a neurosurgeon uh, uh, who specializes in pituitary and skull-based surgery, uh, and I'm located at the House Clinic in downtown LA. Uh, I um, had uh, kind of an extensive training in pituitary surgery, uh, having trained at the uh, NIH and University of Virginia with Ed Oldfield, um, who did a lot of pioneering work uh, specifically for Cushing's disease. Uh, as well as uh, fellowship at MD Anderson with Ian McCutcheon, who also has a very extensive uh, experience with Cushing's disease. So I've uh, had, uh, over the years, uh, pretty significant exposure to Cushing's disease. Um, uh, and uh, my, uh, both my clinical and research interests have uh, focused around pituitary tumors. I've um, authored uh, over 20 publications related specifically to pituitary tumors and uh, four book chapters. Uh, and uh, have had uh, um, the honor of uh, having some of my research um, uh, uh, awarded uh, um, by the American Brain Tumor Association. Great, thank you. So I'm going to start off by talking about Cushing's disease, although the top's not, not only on Cushing's. Many of my patients that are joining today do have Cushing's or are being worked up for Cushing's. So the trick is to distinguish earlier mild Cushing's. Cushing's can be a very devastating disease, and my philosophy is you want to diagnose it early. It's underdiagnosed. It's considered rare, but it may not be that rare. Different series have said it's maybe as, up as high as 2% of people with diabetes or hypertension. However, other diseases have some signs and symptoms in common with Cushing's disease. They include PCOS, metabolic syndrome, and these are much more common than Cushing's, and the treatment is very different from these uh, other diseases versus Cushing's. So therefore, you need to have a good strategy to diagnose Cushing's syndrome. Should Cushing be diagnosed early? I would say yes, although some of my colleagues maybe said you need to wait with better time. And part of it is because Cushing's patients are miserable. Um, they're very low quality of life. I think most people will have Cushing's say um, it's the worst, one of the worst diseases possible, um, and people are really suffering from it. There are effective treatments for it, so such as surgery and medicine. The pharmaceutical funding is better now. There's, there's a company called Corsep that makes Corlum. They are funding some, um, some education related to uh, Cushing's. Uh, about 10 years ago when I went to my Energy Society meetings, there was almost no talks on Cushing's. There was a lot on growth hormone because there were several companies that were either making drugs to treat too much growth hormone or drugs to treat growth hormone, and they would sponsor these big symposiums but much less for Cushing's. Now, the Cushing's ones are very well attended. They have pharmaceutical funding and they're packed with doctors. In spite of that, most doctors are not familiar with Cushing's syndrome. They may only be familiar with severe cases and they may have only seen one or two in their life and maybe just read a textbook on it. So what I do is I look at for a careful history and physical, change in weight and body habitus. I try to look at old pictures, see if the pictures have changed. And, you know, not all patients have all the signs and symptoms of Cushing's, especially early patients and episodic patients we'll talk about. If you look at an article, most articles have compared severe Cushing's with normals, but I think it's important to diagnose early before the devastating sequelae develop. Um, the initial part of the diagnosis of Cushing's determined who has it and who doesn't, I think it's the hardest part of dealing with Cushing's. And um, it's a gestalt, I would like to use that word, 
I try to get as much information as possible. I try to think about the history of physical and the imaging and the testing and try to send the right person to surgery and not the wrong person. So people always ask me, you know, uh, how many tests do I need to do? Um, you know, how, tell me when I'm going to have it. And I always sort of leave that sort of vague because it's always open to, depending on the person, how much testing they need. Um, and uh, I will talk about episodic Cushing. So this means that you have some tests that are high and some that are normal. So positive tests may be more worthwhile than 10 negative tests, but you have to look at the whole picture, how many negative tests and how many positive tests. Common symptoms I see include wired at night, trouble sleeping, trouble falling asleep or frequent awakening, severe fatigue, usually fairly new onset, abrupt waking without any other cause such as decreased activity or depression. You know, somebody breaks their leg and they gain about 15 pounds, that might be expected, but somebody that gains 50 pounds and their activity and their food intake is similar, you have to think about a disease like Cushing's disease. Decreased ability to exercise in women, menstrual abnormalities are very common. Change, uh, cognitive changes, the famous brain fog, decreased libido. And then, as I said, some people have high cortisol and just versus low cortisol. So you can have symptoms of adrenal insufficiency, including joint pains, can't get out of bed, nauseousness, or vomiting. These are the signs of low cortisol. I also see a lot of depression, anxiety, and mood swings. Common signs I see include central obesity with your weight around your stomach, muscle atrophy. You have trouble standing there from a squat, I always test. Thin skin on the top of their hand. This is called little sign. Uh, after Grant Little, who was an uh, endocrinologist in, at Vanderbilt in the late 50s. Uh, a buffalo pump, round red face, bruising, extra hair growth, acne, loss of head hair, and stretch marks. These are common signs I see. Um, the Endocrine Society came out with a consensus practice guideline they'll probably do for another one. This is in May 2008, and I somewhat agree with this. Uh, first line test would be the urinary cortisol, low dorsal overnight dexamethasone test, which I don't think is that good, and nighttime salivary cortisols. Um, testing for Christian syndrome patients with multiple progressive features compatible with the syndrome. If the yeah, patient has an abnormal result, see an endocrinologist and undergo a second test. And some of the other ones include serum midnight cortisol or a dex test. This is their algorithm. They said, um, they, again, the test would be a 24 hour urinary cortisol, two or more tests. Overnight dexamethasone suppression test, which you usually don't do, and late night salivary cortisol testing uh, with two or more, which I think is a good choice. If you have a normal test, consult an endocrinologist, repeat some tests, look at the imaging, and um, consider that if they're still abnormal, Cushing syndrome is made. If the tests are mostly normal, Cushing syndrome is unlikely. If they're discrepant, you have some positive tests and some negative tests, then you have to do additional testing. So episodic Cushing's is the term I use. It's also something that's called cyclical or periodic. But periodic or cyclical refers to changes in cortisol level that occur on a regular predictable base, basis. Episodic refers to high cortisol levels that are random, and most of my patients are episodic. And I agree with the society's recommendations and like to see two different tests that are high. The higher the test, the more likely Cushing's is. Um, and because you have episodic Cushing's, you're in this mess with normal lows, some of the signs may be less than somebody with full-blown or consistent Cushing's. Uh, for example, you might have less weight gain. However, the symptoms, I think, are just as bad as the mild or episodic as the full-blown. Um, they may have just as poor quality of life, if not worse, because they're interspersed with the daytime lows. So these people are really suffering a lot from this disease. So what I usually do is I have people try to test when they're high, they're more wired at night, they're... Um, can't sleep, their stretch marks are darker, their face is rounder, they have uh, diabetes or impaired glucose, their, their, um, their diabetes is worse, their glucose levels are higher, their blood pressure could be higher. So I try to have them do the testing when they have these, those symptoms, including the urine and cortisol, and I test 17 hydroxy steroids, which are cortisol metabolites. I do the, um, the salivary cortisols at night. And then well, usually they come into my office the first time, I do serum cortisols uh, of greater than 7.5, is consistent with Cushing's. And um, I often give people a trial of a medicine called ketoconazol that blocks cortisol synthesis. This helps me figure out how much of their symptoms are due to high cortisol and how much are not. So I'm going to go doing this on normal patients and finally using this as a somewhat diagnostic test. So we're going to talk about the imaging role, and this is where Dr. Metz is going to come in. 
most of the patients I see have pituitary Cushing's disease. Um, at least 95% of my patients, the literature is a little lower, but possibly the people with adrenal Cushing's or atopic Cushing's go somewhere else. They might be easier to diagnose. And the, te the three Tesla MRIs are high quality. Most pituitary tumors are seen on MRI. However, so if you have a clean MRI, it makes Cushing's disease less likely. Not completely impossible, but much less likely. Patients can have a non-secreting tumor called an incidental loma. So just because you have a tumor doesn't make the diagnosis of Cushing's, but it gives you an important piece of information, and then you need to follow that up with the biochemical testing. However, a negative MRI in a patient that, is, that has normal or mildly elevated ACTH pretty much excludes pituitary Cushing's. Patients with adrenal Cushing's have low ACTH. Patients with alpha Cushing's have high ACTH. And I would say, and Dr. Maddox can comment on this a little bit, when he would put, put mm -hmm. the from him, neurosurgeons usually have more expertise in reading pituitary MRIs than radiologists. The radiologists are reading hundreds of them a day. They don't look that carefully. The neurosurgeon, this is the bread and butter life. Uh, they need to look at these MRIs carefully to determine their surgery. And in terms of ketoconazole, ketoconazole is a safe, pretty safe drug. The main side effects being increased liver tests which usually occur at higher doses greater than 1,000 milligrams per day and it's reversible. I use lower doses. I usually use 400 milligrams. Um, it does interact with some drugs, but these can be usually interacted by, um, overcome by changing the drug or watching for side effects. And it has a short half-life, so I'll give it a night, which is when cortisol is <laughs> really high in Christian patients. So I like that over the other drugs that last a long time because you don't want to lower the cortisol in the morning. You just want to lower it at night. So I usually give 200 milligrams at 8 and 10 p.m., and have patients take five milligrams of cortisone or cortex in the morning if needed. And I usually try to do this to determine if uh, which symptoms the patient has are due to high cortisol and which ones are not. I usually the patients I'm pretty sure but not completely sure have Cushing's, and I want them to get symptomatic relief. And I'm concerned if somebody has to get better on on ketoconazole, do they really have Cushing's? And I've kept people on ketoconazole for up to three years without problems. And I often stop it for a round of testing. You could do imaging while on ketoconazole, but not the Cushing's test. So if a patient develops a tumor, we could, you know, we could check their MRI every six months. If they develop a tumor that I didn't see before, or my surgeon didn't see before, we would stop it, do some final testing, and then send them to surgery. And in general, the ketoconazole blocks the cortisol synthesis in the adrenals. So you should have a compensatory rise in the ACTH. And I think when you do get that rise, it may be more of a sign of pituitary Cushing's. So the way I diagnose Cushing's disease, is to have careful history and physical, at least four urinary cortisols and 17 hydroxy steroids. I usually have the patients run them, try to test when they're high, at least four 11 p.m. salary cortisols, a nighttime serum cortisol, an MRI, a ketoconazole trial, and I make the diagnosis if two distinct values are high. I try the patients have a diary and try to collect one in a high. Um, so who goes to surgery? I would like to feel pretty convinced the person has Cushing's and they'll get better from the surgery before sending them to surgery. Um, so they need to have pretty good signs and symptoms of Cushing's, two or more positive values, positive MRI response to ketoconazole, and the patient most importantly has to want to go to surgery. So this is brain surgery. This is not taken lightly. Um, so I, I try to discuss that clearly with the patients of whether they really want to go for surgery or not. Okay, and what type of patients need surgery besides those with Cushing's disease? I'm always asked this question. So first of all, there's uh, acromegaly is too much growth hormone. It's usually from tumors that are often quite big, but sometimes the tumors are small because people are diagnosing acromegaly earlier. Many of the times the patients can go for surgery and get cured. And many of the times, if they have a big tumor, taking out most of it helps them a lot. There are other large pituitary tumors that compress the optic nerve besides prolactinomas. So if the patient has a big tumor, they may need to take it out if it's compressing the optic nerve. Uh, however, prolactinomas are a separate type of pituitary tumor that responds to a medicine called covertly. The tumor usually shrinks, so I usually don't, would not send somebody to surgery if they have a prolactinoma and pituitary damage with cabergoline um, when they could have just, when pituitary damage by surgery, when they could have just been treated with cabergoline. Um, patients with large cranial pharyngiomas, unfortunately, I see many patients that are worse off after surgery. So it's not always clear to me that, at least on retrospect, that the surgery was correct. So it needs to be a very careful decision 
between neurosurgeon and endocrinologist. Um, you also have these patients that are pretty rare and have a growing tumor. Um, I only have two patients I sent to surgery out of maybe a thousand that had a tumor that was growing that it looked sort of nasty, it looked aggressive, and I sent them to surgery and they did well and the tumor started growing. Um, but I don't think that's that common. Most tumors are, ben- are slow growing, they're benign. I don't see thi- uh, majority cancers at all. So most of the patients you can just watch and you don't have to do surgery. There is a condition called Nelson syndrome where you have an adrenalectomy and then you don't have the feedback, so your pituitary starts growing. Those patients usually need surgery and they do well with surgery. Otherwise, they start getting high ACTH levels and hyperpigmentation. So how does the neurosurgeon and the endocrinologist work together? The endocrinologist does the hormone workup. The neurosurgeon consults by reading the MRI to determine if a present tumor is present and the likelihood it could be removed. So most of the time the tumors can be removed, but the neurosurgeon can comment, is this in a difficult part of the pituitary? Is this an easy part? What are the chances of side effects? So they usually have the neurosurgeon look at the patient before the, the final can say that the endocrinologist usually recommends surgery. The and neurosur- neurosurgeon performs surgery and works with the local endocrinologist to ensure proper perioperative management. Um, and they often uh, the surgeon has their own endocrinologist. I usually don't trust the endocrinologist most of the time, but for the perioperative management, they're probably okay. The neurosurgeon performs the endocrinologist of surgical findings and pathology report, and the endocrinologist recommends post-op cortisol replacement and does testing to determine who's cured and who isn't. Okay, I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Mehta now, and he's going to talk. If you want to have comment on anything I said so far, and then you can talk a little bit about MRIs. Uh, thank you, Dr. Friedman. Um, yeah, I, I agree with uh, everything you uh, brought up so far. Um, I think uh, your comment about uh, the local endocrinologist uh, at the hospital um, where the surgery is performed uh, is also very appropriate because oftentimes these endocrinologists uh, haven't uh, gotten to know the patient over a long term uh, or a long time, and Cushing's disease may be uh, relatively um, uh, a rare phenomenon that they, they haven't seen much of. So uh, for the perioperative management, I like to be very involved in the endocrine side of it, um, and, uh, and I completely agree with, uh, with what you said. So I, I'm going to focus on the, uh, the aspects of uh, pituitary imaging, and uh, hopefully by this we'll all be uh, experts in reviewing MRIs of the pituitary. Um, these uh, pituitary MRIs are really a critical step in diagnosis and uh, managing Cushing's disease prior to surgery and prior to making that decision about going forward with surgery. Um, tumors in Cushing's disease can be really, really small when they're uh, symptomatic and uh, sometimes as small as a couple millimeters in size. So uh, that's uh, about a sixteenth of an inch. Um, in diameter, and uh, so sometimes uh, these uh, interpreting these pituitary MRIs can be very challenging. Um, one important uh, point is that when uh, we're getting an MRI for a patient who we suspect has uh, um, Cushing's disease, we want to make sure that we get a pituitary MRI and not a standard brain MRI. A uh, standard brain MRI can be very useful for diagnosing a big tumor, but it's usually not sufficient in uh, finding a very small tumor. The pituitary MRI is really cone down on the area, region of the uh, pituitary gland and give us a much higher resolution in that area. Um, we do these uh, MRIs with intravenous contrast dye. So uh, the MRI technician will, uh, or a nurse will uh, place an IV and actually give it dye during uh, the uh, process of the MRI. And this dye will basically light up blood vessels or anything that has a good blood vessel supply or good blood supply. The pituitary gland itself has a really excellent blood supply and actually uh, has a better blood supply than pituitary tumors. So the pituitary gland tends to be very bright, whereas pituitary tumors tend to be dark on our imaging. Um, another point and, uh, uh, is that uh, and contrast, mm-hmm. cysts are usually bright also, not dark. So you have these people with the wrap these cysts, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and in those cases, we use uh, different uh, kinds of imaging uh, where we can uh, try to differentiate whether or not uh, it's, um, uh, it's bright due to the contrast or if it's uh, just bright on its own. Mm-hmm. 
Um, the uh, Another point is that uh, there are a couple types of MRI scanners um, that you may have uh, all heard about, um, and that's based on how strong the magnet is. And so the most common are 1.5T or Tesla or 3T MRIs. Um, most centers have a 1.5 Tesla uh, MRI, and this is very uh, uh, sensitive for tumors and usually sufficient, but there is some emerging evidence that uh, three Tesla MRIs or three T MRIs are more sensitive and can pick up um, uh, some of the smaller tumors. And then, um, so we, when we interpret these MRIs, we typically look at them in two planes. So I have uh, two images at the bottom of the slide. Uh, on the left is a coronal plane or coronal plane image, which is basically a vertical slice from ear to ear. And so this is uh, how we look at an MRI if we're looking at the patient from the front. And so it's like a mirror, the right and left are flip-flopped with the right side of the screen being actually the left side of uh, the patient and uh, the left side of the screen being the right side of the patient. So if we point to something on the right side of the screen, say there's a tumor on your left, uh, that's, it's correct. It's not that we're getting the sides wrong. Um, and then the other plane that we typically use for uh, um, pituitary MRI is on the right side of uh, the screen here, and it's called a sagittal image. And this is basically uh, a vertical slice that goes from the nose to the back of the head, and it's as if we were looking at uh, the patient from the side. And, uh, and we can advance to the next slide. So, uh, so this is the same uh, uh, coronal image um, uh, magnified, and again, uh, you can see the little R on the left side of the screen. That's because the patient's right is on the left side of the screen. If you could advance, please. So in the center of uh, this uh, image is the pituitary gland, and as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, this is bright from uptake of that contrast dye, which really lights up anything with a good blood supply. Uh, and um, if you advance once more, just above that is the uh, optic uh, chiasm. So this is uh, the optic chiasm, which is basically a connection point for the optic nerves, which uh, take the sensory input from our eyes, um, lies just above the pituitary gland. And this is why when tumors grow very big, uh, they can grow upwards and cause compression on this optic chiasm or the optic nerves and cause visual problems. So this is why uh, this anatomy is very important to us. Um, if you advance again, please. To both the left and the right side of the pituitary gland are another couple important structures. And, uh, and on both sides, we see uh, a large uh, group of veins uh, that, that are called the cavernous sinus. And um, the carotid artery actually runs through this set of veins. And as you can see, it's very close to the pituitary gland. And this is very important when we're planning surgery, we have to be very aware of where the carotid artery is. Um, this area of the cavernous sinus is especially important in Cushing's disease because it's the specific area where these tumors are most likely to recur. Oftentimes, um, uh, a surgeon may leave a little bit of tissue that's going into the cavernous sinus or just uh, invading the cavernous sinus, and uh, that's the area that's been shown by studies to uh, most likely be the site of recurrence. And then uh, one more, if you don't mind, Dr. Friedman. Um, let's see. So uh, looking at the, yeah, right, let's see. So uh, and then looking at the pituitary gland, we can see that it, uh, the area on the left side of our screen here is uh, very bright. Um, and that is the actual pituitary gland itself with the um, high blood vessel uptake and uh, with the contrast dye. And then we can see this uh, small round area within it that's dark. And this is a pituitary tumor in this case. Uh, and if we can advance the slide, please. All right, so uh, another type of pituitary MRI that you may have heard about is uh, called dynamic imaging. And so the timing of when we do these MRIs after when we inject that contrast dye into uh, the patient's veins is very important. Um, typically what we see is that the pituitary gland first becomes bright, 
And then the pituitary tumor at a later point after the injection of that contrast will become bright too. So there's a really short time window between uh, when the pituitary gland becomes uh, bright and the tumor is dark, uh, and then the time when both are bright, that we really want to catch, uh, uh, catch an MRI, because this will show us exactly uh, where the pituitary tumor is. So with uh, dynamic imaging, we uh, first inject dye, and then we get a series of fast but low resolution pituitary MRIs in very quick succession. So these, this is much faster than we can do uh, high resolution pituitary MRI. And uh, in this example on the right side, uh, you can see a pituitary gland um, over time that's uh, imaged repeatedly after the injection of the contrast dye. And we can see that about 45 seconds, that pituitary gland, which is at the center of the screen, uh, is getting bright. And at uh, about 90 seconds in, which is the uh, middle bottom slide, um, you can see an area that's uh, distinctly dark in the middle of this pituitary gland. And uh, that's where the green arrow is pointing to. And then finally, by, uh, and so that, that's actually the tumor. And then by five minutes, when we get our um, uh, high-resolution scan, uh, both the pituitary tumor and the gland are bright. So this dynamic imaging um, is useful in that it uh, helps you catch that optimal time window where the pituitary gland is bright but the tumor is dark. There are some downsides to this, um, and uh, or there is one major downside, and that's because these uh, images are acquired very quickly. They're relatively low resolution. Um, it's hard to see on this image, but the images um, before the five-minute scan are a little bit fuzzy compared to the five-minute scan. Um, so that's a, a standard or high-resolution uh, pituitary MRI. With um, with the dynamic imaging, we're delaying when we do that high-resolution MRI scan, so it usually falls outside of the optimal time window to catch when the pituitary gland is bright and the tumor is dark. And this can lead to some small tumors being missed on MRI. And can we advance the slide? So uh, overall, the MRIs can be very helpful in predicting uh, where a tumor will be at the time of surgery. And uh, this is almost always the case. But because of how small these tumors are, this can sometimes be misleading. And uh, I just wanted to show one example of a tricky case um, uh, of Cushing's disease uh, where the imaging was a little bit misleading, uh, but we eventually uh, um, came to the uh, right conclusion. So in this patient with Cushing's disease, um, they had a, a number of different uh, imaging series, including dynamic and high resolution, and then some experimental uh, study, which is the uh, label flare on the far right. So on the dynamic imaging, which is the low resolution imaging I mentioned before, uh, we can see uh, two areas that are a little dark in the pituitary gland, and that's where the two white arrows are. Um, on a later high resolution imaging, which is the second from the left, uh, there was one clear dark spot. And this is on the patient's left on the right side of the image. On an even later uh, lower resolution or standard uh, pituitary imaging, uh, this is the third from the left, uh, we could still see this bright spot, or sorry, this dark spot that's on the uh, right side of the image, but on the patient's left. And then finally, on the experimental imaging on the far right, uh, we could see an uh, unusual bright spot on the left side of the screen, which uh, Dr. Friedman is pointing to. So, uh, so we had this imaging, and we had a, a clear endocrine diagnosis of Cushing's disease. So we took this patient to surgery and um, explored the uh, left side of the pituitary gland. And so that's the right side of the screen, that image uh, where the arrow is pointing to on the high resolution image on the second from the left. We found a very clear tumor there. It was pathologically confirmed, uh, but the patient did not have an endocrine cure. So they still had very high cortisols and uh, we knew that something wasn't right. So we uh, took this patient back to surgery and, uh, and explored the area which was slightly dark on the dynamic imaging uh, on the left side of the screen on the patient's right, and where Dr. Friedman is pointing right now. And uh, this 
uh, after surgery, the patient had an immediate cure. Within about 24 hours, the cortisol levels dropped, and that turned out to be uh, the uh, hormone-secreting tumor that was causing the Cushing's disease. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Friedman mentioned before, some patients can have incidentalomas. This patient had an incidentaloma and a, a Cushing's uh, disease uh, tumor. Most patients don't have, or most people don't have two tumors, uh, and pituitary MRIs are more clear, but hopefully this uh, case demonstrates um, some of the difficulty we can encounter with these uh, tests. Um, specifically, I think if we had done the higher resolution imaging at that two minute mark, uh, maybe we would have seen these two tumors more clearly. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, this really emphasizes how important the endocrine evaluation is in diagnosis. Uh, while we want to see a tumor, and that makes us feel co confident when we're going forward with surgery, the MRI is really um, a tool to help confirm a diagnosis and can help with the surgical approach. But we really rely on uh, the endocrinologist evaluation to get us there. Dr. Mehta, does a Cushing's tumor look mm -hmm. different on MRI than an incidentaloma? Can you look at the characteristics or anything like that to try right. to figure out which one is the incidentaloma and which is the tumor? So right now we don't have any evidence of that. Uh, there are very few cases uh, that we um, uh, have like this with an incidentaloma and uh, and uh, Cushing's tumor. Uh, in at Oldfield series, I think it was six uh, percent. Of patients had an incidentaloma as well that was identified, but uh, he did not find any differences. Uh, in this case, uh, we found um, uh, some uh, uptake of contrast in the Cushing's tumor um, at later time points, so at that eight-minute time point and at the 30-minute time point after injection of contrast. So that's something that at the NIH um, uh, they're starting to look at, um, especially with a delayed flare imaging, which is an experimental image. Um, for uh, pituitary MRIs for Cushing's disease. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that many uh, interesting scenarios like this where we can really get at this question. But you have that question uh, so, all the time of, you, you, you know, you have a, a mm -hmm. tumor that you, you know, looks like it's Cushing's, but, you know, and then you do the biochemical workup, but you'd like to see yeah. it look like a, a tumor, a Cushing's tumor versus an incidentaloma. So maybe the yeah. the flare might be a good, a useful technique. Yeah, yeah, it would be extremely helpful. Um, so uh, getting to uh, the, so once we've done the imaging and we've confirmed that there's a tumor and we've decided to proceed with surgery, there are a couple of ways we can remove pituitary tumors. And uh, most of you may have heard of the transphenoidal approach, which goes through the nose uh, and then through the sphenoid sinus, which is at the back of the nose to reach the pituitary gland. This is appropriate for about 99% of tumors or more and, um, and can be very effective. Um, but there are some rare uh, tumors that are so large when they're diagnosed that they can't be removed through the nose. Um, this tumor on the right um, is a patient uh, who I saw who uh, presented very late um, for workup and evaluation and had a tumor that was uh, that had extended outside of the pituitary gland and had wrapped around the carotid artery and other blood vessels. So for this uh, patient, uh, I was unable to take out all the tumor from uh, uh, through the nose. So I had to perform a surgery uh, from above, removing a window of the skull and operated in between the lobes of the brain uh, to remove the rest of the tumor. And this is called a transcranial approach. It's how um, People used to take out the majority of pituitary tumors in the 1940s and 1950s before the transphenoidal approach was popular. Uh, again, this, this approach is extremely rare and it's almost never necessary for Cushing's disease, but there are some select cases where we have to uh, be, be uh, able and confident in how to do this. And the next slide. Um, so uh, there are a couple of ways we can do the transphenoidal approach itself. Um, and again, this is an approach through the nose. Uh, and uh, the schematic on the uh, right side kind of illustrates the uh, two ways we can do this and the couple techniques that we can use. Um, the older uh, method of doing this, which has been um, in use since, uh, I, I think the first surgery was in 1967, um, uses uh, a microscope, uh, which is placed just in front of the patient's face and looks down uh, through a speculum uh, uh, through the nose to the pituitary gland. 
Uh, this approach has some advantages. Uh, it, the microscope provides a very stable field of view and requires only one surgeon uh, to perform the surgery. And it's very fast um, uh, compared to other approaches. Uh, another newer method that was uh, developed uh, in the early 1990s uh, uses uh, a different kind of scope called an endoscope. And uh, this is basically a small lighted camera that you can uh, extend into uh, the nose uh, and the back of the nose. And this provides a very wide field of view and uh, a very wide exposure. Um, with this exposure uh, in a single view, we're able to see the pituitary gland and then all the structures around it that we're uh, trying to make uh, sure are safe and, and not injured during surgery, including the optic nerves and the carotid arteries. Um, the, uh, one of the downsides of this approach is it does require two surgeons. So I work with an otolaryngologist when I do this kind of approach um, because uh, you require one surgeon to hold the endoscope and another to do the surgery using two instruments um, to remove the tumor. And um, uh, some, uh, some surgeons will uh, do this alone and they'll use something called an endoscope holder, but I find that uh, with another surgeon, um, uh, they can place the endoscope uh, dynamically exactly where you want it and keep moving it um, so they can follow you and follow your instruments in the field. And then finally, um, there have been a lot of comparisons between the microscopic and endoscopic approaches. They both are very effective uh, for pituitary surgery. Um, there is a little bit less sinus pain um, that has been shown in studies uh, right after surgery, but sinus pain usually uh, reaches the same, uh, or, or uh, I, rather I should say, uh, with both groups, uh, patients typically have very little sinus pain over the long term or any kind of sinus problems. Uh, so both groups reach the same point uh, in the end, um, but in the very beginning, there's a little bit less pain with the endoscopic approaches. And uh, if we can advance the slide. So uh, these are some diagrams uh, that were made uh, by my mentor at Oldfield on how we do this kind of surgery, especially for Cushing's disease. So in the top left, um, uh, we uh, first have to remove bone that's uh, overlying the pituitary gland. And uh, once we remove the bone, we see the uh, meninges. So those are the linings of the brain. We have to open the meninges, and uh, this exposes the pituitary gland, which we can see in the uh, top image on the right. Most often when we uh, expose the pituitary gland and we uh, know where the tumor is, we can usually make out a small bulge where the uh, tumor is uh, pressing on the front of the pituitary gland. And uh, usually this will correspond to the MRI findings. I then uh, on the uh, bottom image on the left, uh, we'll make a cut in the pituitary gland around this tumor. You don't wanna make a cut into the tumor because the tumor uh, is basically a capsule with um, uh, with uh, cells that will spill out um, if you cut it. So you really need to be outside of the capsule of the, uh, the tumor to remove it. And once I made that cut, then carefully dissect around the tumor. So I, uh, on the next slide, I have a video uh, that will play um, that uh, will demonstrate this. And um, you can go ahead and start the video. and. Um, and so this is uh, uh, an image, or basically an image, a uh, video of me taking out a, a Cushing's disease tumor. And um, hopefully uh, none of you are feeling too queasy watching the surgery, but, um, uh, but it shows a patient who had Cushing's disease for a couple years. She had a very high urine-free cortisol, about eight times the normal limit. And the MRI showed a very small tumor, about four millimeters in diameter, or uh, a one-eighth of an inch. So in this video, I've already removed uh, the meninges from over the pituitary gland. And uh, there's a slight bulge in the pituitary gland on the right side of the screen. Uh, so I make a cut using the knife uh, around this bulge. I don't want to cut into the bulge. And once I've done this, now I take another instrument and start dissecting around the, um, this area. And this takes me to the capsule of the tumor, which I'm starting to see here. Um, so this is, this is in real time, um, which will show the entire removal of this uh, pituitary tumor. 
Um, there's a little bit more pituitary capsule that I need to uh, cut at the bottom here. And, uh, and so now we'll cut that. We've released this entire side of the tumor. So doing a little bit more uh, uh, dissection around the tumor. I just want to see that interface. So it's really important not to break into the tumor capsule. And uh, again, this is using a pseudocapsular technique that Dr. Oldfield had developed in the 80s and 90s. There's usually a thin layer of pituitary gland that's overlying the uh, pituitary tumor, and so I've removed that here. And now, now that we have, uh, we're looking at the pituitary tumor, I'm just dissecting carefully around it. And uh, again, this tumor is just an eighth of an inch in diameter. And this is under very, very high magnification at the back of the nose in the pituitary gland. And we're just carefully going around the pituitary tumor to dissect it free from the pituitary gland to kind of remove all the adhesions and connections that are lying between the pituitary gland and this tumor. So this uh, process can sometimes take a while. This tumor um, I use as an example because it's very uh, relatively straightforward. Um, but, uh, but this is what we're trying to achieve with the pituitary tumor removal. A complete removal, where we're staying around the capsule, we're not injuring the normal pituitary gland, uh, and uh, we're making sure that we get every last cell of the tumor because we're uh, not cutting into the capsule. And so this is kind of the final stages of removal. It's released itself from the pituitary gland. Does all your tumors have capsules? So they really all do have capsules. Um, even the large ones uh, have a capsule, and uh, you know it just takes it takes time and and uh, and a little bit of experience to uh, be able to find and identify that capsule. The, uh, for the large tumors, it's usually at the back of the um, tumor bed, um, so you may have to enter the tumor and then find the capsule in the back and dissect around it. Uh, but for microadenomas, they all have capsules. Uh, the one um, one caveat to that is if the uh, tumor is invasive and it breaks through the pituitary capsule or enters the cavernous sinus. And usually there's an encapsulated part within the pituitary gland and the capsule is made up of normal pituitary gland and then, uh, and then you have to remove the part of the cavernous sinus that's involved by tumor. So this patient uh, recovered really well, uh, had an endocrine cure within 24 hours of surgery. And we can go on to the next slide. Is this the same one or different? Okay. Oh, there should be one more, uh, or should be able to advance. Let's see. Try that. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Um, so in some cases, we may not see a, a tumor on MRI, or there may just be a, a faint suggestion of a tumor. Um, and in some of these cases, we may not see that characteristic bulge or discoloration of the pituitary gland um, when we're uh, at surgery and looking for the tumor. Uh, in these cases, if the endocrine evidence is strong, uh, we can still do surgery, um, but sometimes it's uh, uh, a little bit explorative if we have a very strong endocrine case for um, pituitary surgery. So in these cases, what I do um, when we don't know exactly where the tumor is, is I'll make a, uh, an incision in the pituitary gland. That's a top uh, left image uh, or the series uh, two images on the top left. And uh, basically carry that uh, incision further and further back. And so that's the image in um, uh, the third image on the top uh, from the left. Uh, and then the uh, rightmost image on the top. And we carry that incision further and further back until we reach uh, the back of the uh, front half of the pituitary gland. Um, and if we find a tumor in that, uh, in that plane, then we'll remove it. If we don't find a, a tumor, then we uh, move to the side uh, a couple millimeters and make another incision. Um, the, uh, the way the pituitary gland works uh, is uh, the uh, blood supply comes from the top down, so uh, this preserves the majority of the pituitary gland when we're performing it. And so we keep, keep going until we've uh, explored the entirety of the gland. And uh, in most cases, in almost all cases, we'll find a tumor or, or tissue that's suspicious for a tumor.
We can go to the next slide. Uh, so these uh, surgeries typically take about two to three hours. Um, if a uh, tumor is unclear on the MRI, this can take longer. Um, and also, if a tumor enters the cavernous sinus or breaks the pituitary capsule, the surgery is a little bit more complicated, uh, and there are additional steps to be performed, and this can take longer as well. And then after surgery, uh, most patients will have some headache and sinus pain, but this really gets a lot better after the day, by the day after surgery, and by the day after that, there's almost no headache. Um, by the second day after surgery, most of my patients are ready to go home. And the next slide, please. Um, so most patients feel pretty normal by two weeks after surgery. Uh, I like my patients to be seen by an otolaryngologist for nasal cleaning two weeks after surgery. And this really helps to prevent um, pain or crusting in the nose, uh, which can lead to nosebleeds and discomfort. Uh, with the surgery, there are no sutures to remove. Um, and uh, I let most of my patients return to wor work about four to six weeks after surgery. This is really case by case. Um, it can also depend on the severity of the Cushing's disease and other factors uh, related to that. Uh, and then finally, I, uh, I like most of my patients, uh, or I like my patients to avoid uh, heavy lifting or bending four weeks after surgery, because this can increase the risk of uh, a spinal fluid leak, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I would add that um, maybe from a surgical viewpoint, patients feel pretty normal by two weeks. From an endocrine viewpoint, yeah. from high cortisol to sort of normal yes. or lower cortisol, you usually you should feel achy and uh, run down like a truck hit. You people describe it maybe a little bit uh, nauseous, and those are good signs. That means your cortisol. Yeah, is yeah. I'm worried that the patient feels great after surgery and there's no change at all, no negative uh, symptoms. So I like to see sort of people feeling that achy, run-down feeling after surgery. Yeah, absolutely. I think from a, from a nose standpoint, I want, I want people to feel pretty good at two weeks, but, uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, from a whole body standpoint, uh, that's, that's one of the best signs that uh, surgery has been successful. So uh, there are some risks with pituitary surgery. Um, one of the most common uh, risks and the one that's probably talked about the most is uh, cerebrospinal fluid leak or CSF leak. Um, uh, what uh, happens is the uh, brain, is, uh, brain and spinal cord are both surrounded by spinal fluid and this is kept in place by the meninges. Um, this, uh, there is uh, a protective barrier between the pituitary gland and uh, the rest of the brain that prevents spinal fluid from getting down to the pituitary gland. Um, but sometimes uh, there can be a hole in this protective barrier, and sometimes uh, in surgery, in the process of finding a tumor or removing it, we can make a hole in this uh, protective barrier, which causes that spinal fluid, uh, spinal fluid to leak um, out through that hole and into that area where the pituitary gland is. Since we removed all the brain and the, uh, sorry, all the bone and meninges that are uh, overlying the pituitary gland, that fluid can just keep coming out and can come out through the nose. And uh, when we see that at surgery, um, it can be common. Uh, it depends on the type of surgery we're doing. For big tumors, uh, it can occur more commonly, or for uh, tumors that are um, uh, not uh, very clear on MRI when we're exploring the entire gland, that can be more common. Um, but it should not be common after surgery. So once we've uh, finished the surgery, you're in the recovery room, in the next few days, uh, the risk of this should be less than 1%. And uh, there are some steps that we do to minimize this uh, using that uh, extracapsular technique, uh, which uh, Dr. Oldfield had pioneered called the pseudocapsular technique. Really just stays on the border of the tumor. We want to uh, stay away from um, uh, anything outside of the border of the tumor. So uh, there's a protective layer of pituitary gland around our, um, our cavity. Uh, and then uh, if we do see a leak, um, we can uh, treat this a couple ways during surgery. There are some uh, glues that we use uh, at the time of surgery. And we can also uh, place a small graft of abdominal fat uh, uh, in that cavity, which really does a good job of plugging up these holes. Or in cases where there's a big leak, uh, what I do is uh, place something called a lumbar drain, which is a, a catheter that's kind of like a spinal tap that we place in the lower back 
to lower the spinal fluid pressure, basically drain off spinal fluid for uh, three days. And, uh, and this reduces the pressure of the fluid that's coming out through the nose and allows things to seal up. Um, the problem with this is uh, we require patients to be on bed rest for three days while they have this in place, and that's pretty uncomfortable, but, um, but it's uh, important uh, in that we prevent that risk of spinal fluid leak, which can uh, lead to other problems. Again, this should be not common after surgery, but it's something that we have to be uh, able to deal with if it does happen. And then uh, there is uh, also a, uh, another risk called uh, diabetes insipidus. So when we manipulate the pituitary gland, we can um, uh, cause some dysfunction in some of the hormones that are released normally by the pituitary gland. And one of these hormones controls uh, urine output and salt balance uh, after uh, or in our bodies. And uh, if this hormone is uh, low, uh, after surgery, and then it leads to a syndrome called uh, diabetes insipidus, or DI. So some patients, because of this, will have increased urine output after surgery. Um, this is almost always temporary, uh, but needs to be watched for uh, very carefully in the first couple of days after surgery, and needs to be treated carefully as well. Um, so to measure for this or to look out for this, uh, I, I very carefully watch both the urine output. So. Um, uh, the urine output and uh, your blood sodium levels um, very carefully. Um, even a week after surgery, I typically like to get a blood sodium level just to make sure that there's no dysfunction in this hormone because sometimes it can even flip the other way and right. some patients will have too much of this hormone um, and, uh, and very low sodiums, which can cause some other problems. But we just do, uh, the bottom line is we just have to be very vigilant for this. In almost all cases, this is temporary. It's very rare that it's a permanent problem. Uh, and then the next slide, um, so uh, very, uh, more common risk uh, is nasal stuffiness and dryness. Um, this can be very common for about four to six weeks after surgery. Uh, I, uh, in addition to that nasal cleaning I mentioned, I recommend using nasal rinses, uh, which are um, uh, they're basically saline rinses uh, that can be uh, um, uh, packets purchased over the counter. Uh, and I recommend these twice daily for four weeks. It really prevents crusting in the nose and um, and prevents uh, risk of nosebleeds, which can be uh, uh, uncomfortable and, and annoying after surgery. And then. Uh, the kind of uh, final major risk that uh, every pituitary surgeon is always very cognizant of, but um, is extremely rare, uh, is the risk of carotid injury. And again, on that imaging slide, I showed how close that uh, pituitary gland is to the carotid artery. And uh, again, the carotid artery is one of the four major blood vessels that supplies um, uh, or the paired carotid arteries are two of the four uh, major blood vessels that supply blood to uh, the brain. And injuries to the carotid artery can cause a stroke. It can be a very uh, uh, dangerous uh, situation. But this, uh, the risk of this has really dropped um, over time. And, uh, and this for a couple, a couple of reasons. One, I think with the endoscope, we're really able to see the anatomy around the pituitary gland. Um, but regardless, um, uh, I think a surgeon should always use either a Doppler at surgery or we have some tools for intraoperative image guidance to really mark out where the carotid artery is. And if we know where the carotid artery is, it, it, the risk of uh, injuring it is, uh, is infinitesimal. It's really, really low. Um, if the tumor extends into the cavernous sinus, however, uh, there is an increased risk um, uh, if uh, uh, if we remove tumor from that region. Um, but uh, even if we have an injury, it's not, uh, uh, you know, there are some very effective uh, methods of dealing with it that are getting better um, every year. And, uh, and these uh, injuries can be treated by interventional radiologists. But, um, but again, uh, bottom line is this is extremely unusual and unlikely uh, in experienced hands and uh, but it is something that we're always thinking about and always prepared for as surgeons. And I think that's uh, all the slides I have. All right. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mehta. So we have some time for questions. We did a pretty close to an hour already, but we'll maybe have about 10 minutes of questions. Please use your chat button. Um, thank you for sharing your time tonight.
Um, if you have questions after tonight or want an appointment with me, you can contact us at mail at goodhormonehealth.com or make even better, make an appointment on my website, goodhormonehealth.com. The webinar will be posted on my website in a couple of days at goodhormonehealth.com. To meet, reach Dr. Meta, he's happy to see patients um, uh, that need surgical intervention. Most of them will probably get referred from me, but you know, if you have a question about surgery, you want to talk to him, um, you can make an appointment with his assistant, Naomi. His website is houseclinic.com slash meta. And let's, um, let's open up the questions on the chat here. So please uh, use the chat button and ask us uh, questions what you like. Uh, maybe I'll start then while people are coming up with questions. What do you think the role of the patrol to sign is? Uh, absolutely. So I, I think, um, you know, what we, we have seen is that uh, patrol sinus sampling is not very good for lateralizing the side of the tumor or localizing where a tumor is. But I think patrol sinus sampling is um, a very useful tool in making an equivocal uh, or uh, helping to make a diagnosis. Um, uh, I think for for the people in the audience who are unfamiliar with petrosal sinus sampling, uh, it is basically a method where we uh, uh, put a catheter in the groin and snake it up to uh, the venous drainage or the veins that drain the pituitary gland, and we can measure hormone levels at the pituitary gland. So if cortisol and ACTH are, or sorry, if ACTH is being um, secreted by the pituitary gland, we can measure it right there and see that it's high. Um, and so that uh, can help uh, eliminate some of the uncertainty uh, before proceeding with surgery. Um, but uh, it's still a procedure, it's a surgical procedure, so there are risks. So it's something that uh, you know has to be just, uh, thought about very carefully before you proceed with it. And I would add that it's helpful to distinguish between ectopic and pituitary and a little bit Absolutely. of and pituitary. It's not useful to make the diagnosis of Cushing's. Um, when I was at the NIH like 25 years ago, my colleague, Dr. Yanofsky, did a study with normal people. And normal people, their patrol sound sampling looked exactly like a Cushing's patient. They had a <laughs> peripheral gradient. They had uh, responded to CRH. They lateralized the left side, almost all of them. So I, I'm, I, I use it very little. Um, and then yeah. the MRI is being better, um, and also the testing of like ACTH levels to determine if somebody has a topic or a or a pituitary, I don't use it too much. So, uh, yeah. so Cindy has two questions. The first question is, if the tumor's in the back of the gland, do you cut through the front to get to it? And can a patient use CPAP after the procedure? Right. Uh, so... Um, for the, the first question, uh, yes. So there are... Um, uh, there are, uh, the pituitary gland is uh, split up into two lobes, the anterior and posterior lobe. And so the anterior lobe is the part that we first see uh, when we uh, go through the back of the nose to, to reach the pituitary gland. Um, almost all pituitary, uh, pituitary tumors are uh, involved with this uh, anterior lobe, and that's where the uh, cells that secrete ACTH come from. Uh, so almost all uh, ACTH secreting uh, tumors, the tumors that are uh, involved in Cushing's disease, are in this anterior lobe, and uh, and so we usually don't have to cut through too much of the pituitary gland to get to the tumors. Uh, there are some tumors um, that uh, can be located in the posterior lobe where we'll actually have to go through all of the anterior lobe to reach it, um, and uh, and that. Um, it can be a little bit more challenging and uh, and can take a little bit more time to do, but uh, that's part of the process when we're uh, if we have to do a gland exploration for tumor uh, is explore not only the front part of the uh, pituitary gland from side to side, but uh, the pituitary gland from front to back. Uh, but it's it's very rare for a tumor to be located in the back part. Uh, and then in terms of CPAP, uh, so I, for me that really depends on whether or not there's a spinal fluid leak. Um, if there's a spinal fluid leak after surgery, I really don't like uh, patients using uh, CPAP because uh, some of that pressure can be transmitted uh, basically th uh, through that hole and, uh, and uh, to the area where the brain is. So I like to avoid that for about four weeks after surgery. Um, with uh, patients who do not have a, a spinal fluid leak, if there's no problems, then uh, I'm 
uh, more liberal with that, but uh, usually like to wait at least a week after surgery for things to heal up. Yeah. Uh, her question is next one to me is how is their topic getting years from pituitary diagnostic late? So patients with ectopic Christians usually have much higher levels of cortisol. Their cortisol, your cortisol is in the hundreds, if not higher. They have pretty severe symptoms. They have very high ATPH levels. Patients with pituitary Christians have more milder disease. Their ATPH is in the upper normal. Um, to, to slightly above normal, um, and then you know more set more symptoms. So most of my patients are pituitary. I think the topic because they present more severely, um, are go to go to other people and get picked up earlier. But I have patients that uh, I occasionally think they may have a topic, and we could do things like pertussis sinus sampling or uh, a pre tied skin to diagnose them. Okay, next question. We're not getting more questions. Go ahead and ask questions, please. Does everybody have uh, the chat function? If you want to try to use, um, um, you want to talk, talk into it and ask your questions that way. Okay. That's not going to work all too well. Put back the mute on, sorry. So I think it's better to um, uh, be ask the, the chat questions. That didn't seem to work too well. So um, we've got a lot of questions now. So Lisa asked, what is the difference between a tumor cyst and a lesion? Uh, Dr. Mehta, do you want to answer that one? And I probably need to un Hang on a second, Dr. Mehta, I muted mm -hmm. you. Okay, here we go, Dr. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a lesion is uh, any um, kind of abnormality that we see. So it could represent uh, a tumor or a cyst. We may refer to it as a lesion. Sometimes you'll see that on uh, MRI report, uh, uh, something uh, abnormality is labeled as a lesion because it's just more generic. It's um, uh, not necessarily committing to a tumor or a cyst or a certain kind of pathology. Um, uh, the uh, tumor and the cysts are, are two uh, things that we actually see in the pituitary glands. And um, a tumor, again, uh, is going to be a collection of cells uh, that have divided abnormally. Um, and they'll typically find a, a form kind of a, a round um, uh, structure within the pituitary gland, especially in Cushing's disease. Cysts are very common in the pituitary gland, um, and uh, they can be either benign or, in rare cases, they can be pathologic or they can be um, uh, tumor-related. Um, so sometimes we see uh, a little cyst between the front half of the pituitary gland and the posterior half, um, and, uh, and those are called intermediate lobe cysts. Um, there are other cysts which are uh, on a spectrum of tumors uh, called Rathke's cleft cysts and craniopharyngiomas, um, but those are, are essentially, uh, especially the craniopharyngiomas, are essentially tumors uh, that have a fluid-filled collection within them. I'm sorry, I, I didn't say that in the beginning, but a cyst is something which contains fluid uh, within it, a tumor being an abnormal, abnormal collection of cells. Tumors are usually solid. Yeah. yeah. Are there specific symptoms if the tumor is located in the posterior pituitary? I guess I can answer that one. So if it is, you can have dysfunction of your posterior pituitary hormones. The most common one that Dr. Mehta mentioned is ADH, which is the one that gives you diabetes insipidus. So if you have a posterior tumor, you can more likely get diabetes insipidus either from the tumor or from the surgery. Um, I'm also very interested in a hormone called oxytocin, which is also from the posterior pituitary that seems to be part of emotions and bonding and trust and things like that. And that's the same thing. The patient with posterior pituitary tumors 
are more likely to have an oxytocin deficiency and have some of those symptoms. We would then test you for 24-hour urine for oxytocin and treat you for oxytocin if that's the case. Um, Sharon asked the question, maybe both of us can answer this, and what's the likelihood of recurring mm-hmm. tumor following surgery? So unfortunately, Cushing's t- t- tumors uh, have a tendency to come back. And um, I think some of it depends on the surgeon, but I think some of the Cushing's tumors, I see them as like little octopuses. They have different legs, and they have different things extending all over the different plane, and you, know, you get most of the cells, but you leave a few cells behind and they come back. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but I see that. So I would say on my patients, maybe because I catch them earlier and they're not as encapsulated, they're not as well formed, I would say about 60% of my patients are cured and 40% either not cured or comes back. And what do you think, uh, Dr. Meta? Yeah, I, I think uh, so. It really depends on uh, the clinical picture. It, just like you're saying, if um, uh, if we're kind of catching something early and it's not uh, not uh, a large kind of discrete uh, tumor, then uh, that 60 percent uh, cure rate is, is very accurate. If I do see a, a well encapsulated tumor like the one uh, I showed in the video, um, the risk of it coming back is very, very low. So uh, for those uh, tumors, uh, um, the risk of coming back uh, with a pseudocapsular technique uh, is about, uh, or sorry, the risk of uh, cure uh, over the long term is about 90 to 95%. Um, but again, if the tumor is not well encapsulated, if, uh, if you don't get a good pseudocapsular plane around the tumor, uh, or if it's extending into the cavernous sinus, all of those can be uh, uh, greater risks of the tumor um, coming back. So, uh, so it really depends on the patient uh, and the pituitary gland. Okay, great. Now we're getting a lot of questions. Uh, Chad asks, how yeah. often do you deal with patients that the pituitary does not work at all? Um, I deal with that a lot. Um, I presume this is directed to me. And um, I have patients that are panhypopit. They have to replace all their hormones, uh, cortisol, thyroid, growth hormone, testosterone, uh, sometimes the vasopressin, sometimes oxytocin. Um, and I think it's an art. The hormones interact with each other. Um, they, they all need to be optimized optimally, otherwise the patient doesn't do too well. So I'm happy to see you, Chad, if you're you want to make an appointment with me. Uh, Susan asked, what is the average time to diagnose cyclical Cushing's? Uh, cyclical Cushing's is hard to diagnose. Again, I like the term episodic. But, um, you know, some people you can pick the highs up, and right away you can still send them to surgery. Other people, they have to do a lot of testing. I would say the average time might be about six months for diagnosis. Uh, Cheryl asked, if you already have partial diabetes insipidus, would you have a higher chance of it becoming complete after surgery? Uh, I'll start with that, and maybe Dr. Meta could add. You know, I think if you have partial diabetes insipidus and you're already treated, you know, you basically you're taking DDAVP. It doesn't matter if you take two pills or one pill. I don't know about that. About that. Maybe, maybe it does. You know, maybe somebody with mild diabetes insipidus, they're going to urinate a little bit more at night. It's not so bad. When you get complete, um, it's worse. And I would say, yes, that is likely. If you have partial diabetes insipidus, you already have something wrong with your anatomy, your posterior pituitary. So I would say the chances of becoming complete are higher. Dr. Meta, what do you think about that one? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think, um, uh, you know, if you already have uh, that uh, that injury, then uh, you're going to be more, more vulnerable or more at risk uh, for uh, having further injury um, uh, to that area. I completely agree with that. Okay. Bowl asked, with episodic Cushing's, if a patient finds it hard to correlate symptoms, that's a how do you recommend proceeding with testing? serial testing, if so, how many days in a row. Um, I still try to recommend people to test when they're in a high. You know, just try to chart it through diaries, and then we look back and see, yes, this test was high, you had X symptoms, and then we can go forward with testing when you have those symptoms. It's hard to do. Um, some of the things would be objective things, like uh, blood pressure testing and post-meal glucose, I use a lot. There is a salivet made by... Um, a company, iCalc, I-C-A-L-Q, that goes under the smartphone. Um, I'm not sure how well it works. It might be better than nothing, but not that much better than nothing. And I talked to the better general Aaron Prince, and he's not recommending it for cushioning. It's supposed to be sort of for people to follow their mood. Um, I was always hoping that uh, we would have something like that by, this, by now. As the Beach Boys said, wouldn't it be nice? Um, but unfortunately, um, I don't think it's great, but you could try that also. And asked, what sort of care is taken during surgery patient has developed dilated cardiomyopathy due to Cushing's? How quickly can you expect to see a reversal of dilated cardiomyopathy after surgery? 
Um, I don't know. I know that's a tough question. I think you got to work with the crisis. Yeah. Um, Cushing's people do have um, diastolic dysfunction and sometimes the cardiomyopathy. Uh, you know, the heart's a muscle, and Cushing's can affect the muscle. Um, I think Dr. Meto probably like you seen by your by your cardiologist and clear by Absolutely. Your surgery. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'd like uh, a cardiology evaluation um, by your cardiologist who knows you um, before surgery to see if there's anything we can do before surgery or during surgery um, uh, to minimize risk. Uh, you know, especially with Cushing's disease, and same goes for acromegaly. I, I, I you know, I like to uh, work carefully with the anesthesiologist to make sure that they're especially the vigilant about blood pressure control and um, uh, and cardiac function during surgery. Um, and then after surgery, I, uh, I think uh, maybe, uh, Dr. Friedman, you have more experience yeah. with that? Um, right. I don't see too much cardiomyopathy, but again, I think just like your muscles mm -hmm. get better, if people could get better with this, I think you need to work with yeah. your cardiologist after surgery, um, and uh, it's possible you do, you'll get better. Last question will be from Bowl. A patient has brought on, a Christian brought on by low sodium, and that can be corrected from surgery. Definitely, yeah. So, Christian can give local care yeah. and it's correctable. And I would say, in general, most of the symptoms people have with low, with uh, Christian to get better with surgery, not everything, but most of them are reversible. So, I do encourage people to be aggressive in their workup. Um, I want to thank Dr. Meta for a great uh, rep webinar. We'll post this again in a couple of days, and uh, we'll be um, in touch with everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you all. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.